Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Endlinger Center um, Highlight Seminar. Uh, today, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, be here to introduce uh, our speaker, Chris uh, Brazelton. Um, Chris uh, is, a, is, a, is the Senior Director of Climate Modeling at the Allen Institute uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, Washington, in Seattle. Uh, he has pioneered the use of machine learning for, for atmospheric science and, and climate modeling. Um, and so the, the work uh, he's been talking about, uh, is, is the work he's going to be talking about today uh, um, is going to be about the use of machine learning trained on uh, global cloud resolving models and observational data to uh, improve uh, climate models. He's an emeritus professor um, of, at the University of Washington, um, where he was in the Department of Atmospheric Science and Applied Mathematics. Uh, he, he, he was working there for over 30 years. He has received many uh, awards and recognition uh, throughout his career, um, including the American Meteorological Society Charney Award, and he's an AMS and AGU fellow, and uh, he's an elected member of the National Academy of Science. And so uh, with that, I would like to uh, welcome Chris, and uh, I'll give him the floor. Okay, well, thanks, Luke, and uh, thanks to the Endlinger Center for inviting me out here to Princeton. It's been great talking to people already, and it's going to be a great chance to talk to all of you, too. Um, I started my career a long time ago, um, well, this 40 years ago, uh, as a professor uh, at the University of Washington. My uh, area of expertise um, was on both observing and uh, understanding and simulating the role of clouds and small-scale circulation turbulence um, in the atmosphere, and, and in particular, how we represent those in weather and climate models. Uh, so I kept doing that for a long time. It's a great career. Uh, and then three years ago, I had the opportunity to participate in a, a new um, project um, which I'll tell you about uh, more later, but basically led me to uh, get interested in the use of machine learning for improving weather and climate models. Um, and basically inspired by my experience in how we did it before, I thought that there was a lot of potential in doing this. And so uh, basically this talk will talk you through a little bit about both what conventional climate models can do and also maybe how machine learning can add to what those models can do. Okay, so let's try this. Okay, so basically what we'll do is um, talk about three things. Um, the first one is what climate models find easy and hard to predict, about, uh, especially about anthropogenic climate change. Uh, and, and then try to give you an idea of why that's the case, so that you can understand that not all things about climate are equally hard, and therefore we shouldn't have the expectations that climate models are going to be perfect in predicting everything. Um, then uh, I'd also like to talk about a new class of models, um, which include one developed at uh, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, which is uh, here at Princeton, um, which I think can possibly uh, improve our representation of climate quite a bit, especially if uh, combined with machine learning. And uh, then that will be the last part of the talk, is how we can use machine learning to leverage these, this new class of models to hopefully make better climate predictions in future. OK, so the motivation for uh, this, the machine learning part of this project actually came from one of the things that we have difficulty with uh, in climate modeling, which is the prediction of regional precipitation trends. So, uh, for instance, I come from Seattle. I'm interested in what's going to happen in the Pacific Northwest uh, over the next 50 years to, um, to precipitation. And uh, that's not just of interest to me as a person or as an outdoor enthusiast. That's uh, also of vital importance to agriculture, to uh, hydropower, uh, to uh, the water available for cities and so on in the area. So everyone would like to know, is there going to be more or less water available in the future? 
Um, of course, we know that most of that water is going to be, it's, the water is going to be more available as rain and less as snow and probably in different parts of the seasonal cycle. But generally speaking, um, you know, more rainfall would make our life easier in the future in terms of adapting to climate change. Well, okay, so if you look at what climate models um, do, we can ask, um, and this is information from climate models that are uh, a generation or two uh, out of date, but nevertheless, the newest generation would basically tell you the same story. Uh, the plot on the left shows uh, traces from a bunch of different climate models run over the historical period, um, starting in 1900, out to, uh, through a future scenario of increasing greenhouse gases out to 2100. Uh, so each one of those lines represents the decadal average of, uh, of temperature as we go through this period. And the thicker solid line indicates the observations up to the year 2000, decade by decade. So you can see all of these models tracked the uh, climate to date by design. They, all, all the climate modeling groups know what the climate was. If the climate model differed a lot from the current climate, uh, then they would have tweaked it. Um, and, um, and in future, they all predict that the temperature is going to increase by you know, a range of amounts, which is pretty significant. But nevertheless, they all predict a large temperature increase uh, over the next century with this greenhouse gas emission scenario. Uh, the plot on the right is precipitation. So again, one thing to notice is the observations are very variable. There's no trend in them between 1900 and 2000. There's no hint about whether precipitation is going to increase or decrease in a greenhouse warm climate. Um, and now you can see that the models divide into two classes, one of which um, basically the precipitation slightly goes down over the region. And then there are three or four outlier models where it goes up quite a bit. And so we would like to know, you know, which of these is right. Right now we can't say which of these models is better than any other model, but they definitely uh, affect uh, future risks in the area, of things like drought, wildfire, um, and potentially things like uh, winter flooding. So local precipitation matters to people. Climate models uh, still have a lot of uncertainty as a group in getting this right. Uh, and so that matters to society. Could we possibly do a better job? Okay, well, it's important to understand how climate models work. And uh, I'll specifically talk about the atmospheric component of climate models. But other parts of climate models, uh, which involve things that move, like the ocean, um, are, are, are pretty similar. So basically, uh, the idea is that the atmospheric part of a climate model is basically just a weather simulator. It is going to calculate the climate of the Earth by accumulating statistics of a simulated weather from uh, decades hence, and, uh, and then looking at what the means are, what the extremes are, and so on. And so, um, again, to appreciate this problem, the satellite picture on the left shows uh, an extreme precipitation event on the west coast of the United States. The, the, the clouds here um, uh, are a frontal zone which, um, where warm air is coming up in what's called an atmospheric river and impinging on California and producing heavy rain. Uh, you can also see many other things. You, this, in this cold airflow, you can see a bunch of uh, popcorn-like clouds here. Um, there's a lot of structure here on all scales. And so you can see the atmosphere is actually a pretty complicated thing to simulate. And in order to get the weather right, we actually need to simulate this all quite accurately. Um, so how do we represent this uh, real, obviously very complicated system? Uh, well, what we do is we uh, put the atmosphere on a grid, uh, a three-dimensional grid. Um, the spacing of the grid is basically depends on what we can afford with our computational resources. Um, in a typical current climate model, that might be uh, a grid spacing of anywhere from 25 to 200 kilometers, depending on if I wanted to do simulations of a decade or centuries. Uh, and, uh, and then on that grid, then, we're simulating the winds, all the fluid motions. And we're also simulating a whole bunch of physical processes. So the physical processes might include things like clouds and precipitation, turbulence, 
the interaction of the atmosphere with sunlight and with radiation, infrared radiation emitted by the surface. There's an underlying land model, which can be quite complicated uh, as well. Um, and, and, and so on, the interaction of the atmosphere with mountains. And uh, each one of these processes is actually a separate piece of code in the climate model that some expert wrote by hand. So there's a lot of subjectivity in that code. And so there is, in fact, a lot of potential for uncertainty in the climate model that's due to these physical representations and uh, these representations of physical processes in the climate. So as a result, you know, from the point of view of a model developer, I do not expect a weather or climate model to be perfect because it involves a certain, first it involves representing the atmosphere on a discrete grid, and secondly, it has all of these processes in it that we only imperfectly understand and can only imperfectly translate that understanding into computer code. Okay, uh, well, let's take a look at the um, evolution of climate models. So here in Princeton, it's kind of a special place. Um, Suki Minabe at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab was one of the initial pioneers of, um, of climate modeling in the 1960s. Um, so that was here at Princeton. And uh, over the past uh, 70 years, uh, 60 to 70 years, climate models have evolved a lot. So basically, climate models have evolved in two ways. Uh, first, as computers have got more powerful, uh, we use finer and finer grids because we know that with a finer grid, we can better represent the, the atmospheric flow uh, past all the complex geographic features of Earth. So this indicates um, how, how that happened over the course of uh, basically since from 1990 to about 2010 or so. Um, so during that time, there was basically about a factor of five decrease in grid spacing. Uh, and since then, you know, now we have climate models that can simulate for as long as a century at 25 kilometer resolution, which is about four times this resolution. In addition, though, there are a lot more physical processes than climate models now. We started with rain. We didn't even have rain falling from clouds. It just fell from somewhere. Um, then we had um, clouds. We had an ocean. Uh, then we started thinking about aerosols. So um, that's sort of one human input into um, the climate system is, is um, pollution, which uh, then the aerosols can get in the atmosphere. They can reflect sunlight. They can modify clouds. Um, then we started worrying about uh, ice and the uh, ocean and atmospheric chemistry, uh, as well as natural phenomena like um, volcan volcanoes, uh, the natural um, biosphere, vegetation change. And so, you know, at this point, even at this point, um, we're talking about a very complex system with obviously a lot of code involved in representing this. Um, in the past 10 years, the, the complexity of these representations has increased even further. And another thing that we do is we run a large ensemble of simulations, so maybe 50 simulations with each climate model to see you know, how much just the random variability of, you know, of, of weather and climate from one year to the next might influence our predictions. Okay, so doing this actually takes an enormous increase in computer power. Each doubling of resolution of a climate model increases by a factor of about 10 the amount of computer uh, cycles needed to solve it. And so this has really been enabled by Moore's law, the doubling of computational power uh, every um, one and a half or two years. Um, that's still going on, but now it's mainly going on by computers being more and more massively parallel rather than running faster, because it turns out to run a computer chip faster takes more power, and now we're running into the limitations that our climate models are so complex that we can't afford to run them uh, without basically consuming a lot of electricity that was produced by greenhouse uh, by greenhouse emissions that obviously make the whole problem worse. Okay, so uh, one way that these, um, the results of all of the climate models run around the world are conveyed to the public is through the IPCC reports, uh, which come out about every six or seven years. 
And uh, so those um, take advantage of a structured set of simulations by all the world's leading climate models, where they all basically try to run a set of similar scenarios to see, OK, well, how similar or different are their predictions? And, um, and basically, this process has, um, I think, resulted in a lot of consensus in the community. And also, uh, it, it's sort of a very international process. So as a result, countries all over the world are sort of able to access the same information um, about how good climate models are. Um, that's, been a, that's been a very good thing. Um, here's an example of the current uh, set of projections uh, from the sixth assessment report released last year. So basically, um, what you see here, for instance, this is the historical uh, climate record of surface temperature. And then these are runs into the future with different greenhouse gas emission scenarios. And basically, this is less, this is more CO2 getting into the atmosphere. This is if we were able to magically, basically almost completely remove our uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the next few years. Uh, you can see if we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, you know, the trend of all the models is that n the climate would only warm a little bit more, while with more greenhouse gas emissions, uh, they warm a lot more. OK, well, what's special about this is, the, is this um, shading. So the shading indicates actually the range of uncertainty of all of the models around the central line, this SSP37 line. And similarly, here's the, sh the shading is, again, a measure of uncertainty. So this is the model uncertainty, and this is the emission scenario uncertainty. And as long as you're uh, interested in what's going on after about 2050, uh, the model uncertainty does not dominate uh, the, the policy uncertainty, if you want. So, so therefore, these models are useful for making policy decisions. So um, if you look at some other things, you can see uh, also um, places where models agree better or worse. So this one's, for instance, ocean acidification, the pH of the global ocean surface, which is going down. That's the problem of ocean acidification. Uh, now you can see, actually, all the models agree extremely well about that. It's because ocean acidification comes from CO2 getting from the atmosphere into the oceans. Every model has the same amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So basically, all the models know how to put it in the oceans. Um, if you look at some other things like sea ice, so sea ice is melting. It's probably going to disappear in the summertime, at least some summers in the next couple decades. Um, and again, now you see the models have a lot of uncertainty. But nevertheless, they all kind of agree that um, sea ice is going to disappear uh, by uh, the end of the 21st century. Sea level change, here's another good example. Um, Again, the models can differentiate a little bit between uh, a low emissions and a high emissions scenario. But what's interesting here is here's a dotted line. This indicates that sort of a worst case scenario where we had a lot of um, ice sheet collapse, say, uh, in the Antarctic or, uh, um, well, specifically the Antarctic and perhaps also Greenland, um, contributing to sea level rise. That's not actually even in these models, so it had, has to be added. Uh, by hand. So here what you see is kind of a mixture of things the models do very well, things the models do pretty well, and things the models um, do well enough to be useful, but uh, not that well. So um, basically what this process has given us is models that are good for mitigation. They can differentiate different pol um, policy paths. But there's still large modeling uncertainties, and you have to downscale the models to a finer scale if you want local guidance, say, for climate adaptation. OK, so I have a little chart here about robust, indicated in green, and less robust, indicated in orange, aspects of simulated climate change by our current models. And I, I don't want to um, belabor this, since uh, Probably this won't be of interest to most of you. But I guess I do want to say, OK, there's a set of things that climate models are particularly good at. So one of them is, although we may, although we may be uncertain about how much and how fast it's going to warm in future, the pattern of warming is actually quite similar between climate models. It warms more over the continents than the oceans. It warms more in the polar regions than the equatorial regions. 
um, as the atmosphere warms, it can hold more water vapor. Because it can hold more water vapor, if that water vapor is suddenly lifted up in a storm, it can rain out, and so you get more extreme precipitation. And it can hold 7% more water vapor for every degree C atmos the atmosphere is warmer, so you can get a lot more precipitation out of an atmosphere that's just a little bit warmer. Um, anything involving uh, changes from ice to liquid, like snow versus rain, uh, or, or whether sea ice is going to disappear from the Arctic, models are reasonably good at, because that's very tied to temperature. Extreme heat waves, same way. Uh, sea level rise is another thing, and ocean acidification. Uh, these are both things that models are good at. Then there are other things that models aren't so good at. So one of them is climate sensitivity, talked about how much it's going to warm. Regional precipitation trends, I talked about. Changes in cloud patterns are another thing that climate models struggle with. Uh, effects of aerosol, human aerosol on climate. Um, the structure of uh, deep ocean warming and whether ice sheets are going to be stable. Those are things that are, are problems. And the stability I indicated is red because these models don't really even make a prediction about that. So the point about this is there are some things that climate models do well, some things they do less well. And so you may ask the question, OK, well, why? Why is it they have trouble with some things? And why is it they don't have trouble with others? So um, if, we, if we think about this a bit more, uh, the, the things that climate models agree on, the robust aspects of global warming, tend to have some common features. So one common feature is they have a simple physical connection to either CO2 rise or the warming that we get from the greenhouse effect of the atmosphere to that. Uh, uh, a second feature is that they tend to have the same response everywhere. You know, for instance, if it warms, the whole planet warms. Uh, and lastly, if we have observations in the historic record, uh, there are there, um, things that can be tested um, tightly with the historic record are things that we feel like we can understand better. So examples of processes like this are the greenhouse effect. We can measure that in the lab. Um, that CO2 uh, traps uh, or, or absorbs um, infrared radiation and therefore keeps the Earth warmer. Ocean acidification, it's a very direct uh, effect of um, the ocean absorbing CO2 produced in the atmosphere. The water vapor feedback, so more water vapor in a warmer atmosphere is, again, something that can be traced back to basic physics in which we can observe in satellite observations. The snow ice, ice albedo feedback is that uh, as the climate gets warmer, you have less snow. It reflects more sun. You, re you reflect less sunlight back to space. And again, that's very much tied to temperature, the, wherever it's above or below zero degrees on average. And in fact, if you take a look at um, how much uh, the climate warms, so this is the kind of issue of uh, the climate sensitivity, you can break that down into feedbacks. And some feedbacks, in particular the feedbacks from water vapor and from surface albedo, um, you know, the feedbacks are uncertain, but we know what the sign of the response is. While from clouds, for instance, we kind of think that there's a positive cloud feedback that in a warmer climate, clouds will tend to go away, allow more sunlight into the system, and cause further warming. But we don't know how much it is or even exactly what the sign is. And so basically, that's an example of a more uncertain process. So we have a set of relatively robust certain processes. What about the less certain processes? OK, so the, pro the reason some processes are harder for climate models is because, um, in many cases, they're strongly tied to atmospheric circulations. So for instance, clouds form when air rises, typically, and cools. and the water vapor, and it condenses. Um, as much air has to rise in the atmosphere somewhere, it sinks somewhere else. So you know, circulations can change in a warmer climate, or they can intensify, but they still have to cancel out. You still have, have to have as much air going up and down. So if you have something that's tied to circulations, then naturally there's going to be a tent for canceling um, responses from the up and downward branch of the circulations. Um, 
Another feature of less robust processes is that they can be sensitive to things we're sci scientifically uncertain about. So things like uh, turbulence, um, is, it's a very tough process. It's very small scale. The model doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't um, actually simulate it at all, and it has to be put in by uh, experts like Duke, Luke Dyke, who, you, uh, who introduced me. Um, and, uh, and then we can also have other processes like ice clouds. Ice clouds are this very complicated physics involved in them that we still don't really fully understand how to put into a climate model. And lastly, um, a characteristic of things we have a less robust understanding of in climate models are that there may be substantial observational uncertainties. So there might be a lot of year-to-year -year variability. That's certainly true for clouds. Um, or we may not be able to measure something very well, like an ice cloud is in the upper atmosphere. You know, you've got to get a plane up there to measure it or, or try and infer things from space. And I just wanted to talk about cloud feedbacks as an example of this. So here, cloud feedbacks here, I'm bringing up this example because if you ask, why is it that some models produce um, a stronger response of stronger warming response of climate to a certain CO2 change than others, it turns out the main reason, main single reason, has to do with the cloud response to the climate change. So again, as I said, clouds uh, tend to form where air is moving upward. It could be moving upward on very small scales or very big scales. And, uh, and so if you take a look at cloud changes from the set of models that go into IPCC, um, you can see regions where the clouds um, tend to increase, uh, averaged over the full suite of models that participate, and average in places where they decreased. In this case, this dipole of um, decrease and increase is mainly associated with the part of the cloud forming part of the atmosphere, the troposphere actually deepening in a warmer climate. So, but you can see that there's already canceling responses there. Uh, and then the stars indicate where all the models agree with each other, or almost all the models agree with each other. And you can see that there are a lot of parts of this picture that the, that the models agree on. But now if you want to average all of these changes to get a single number, they, you know, there's a lot of cancellation here, and there's a lot of possibility for different models to produce different cancellations and different cloud feedbacks. So that's the example of, you know, we have a lot of cancellation. Also, clouds are sort of uncertain, and one of the kinds of clouds the mo that are most uncertain are the ones that are here, lying right near the surface, which rely on surface turbulence and moisture lifted from the surface to, um, to be produced. And so that's an example of the second bullet. And furthermore, you might think that, well, we have a 100-year record of global warming. Surely we should be able to figure out what's going on. Well, it turns out it's not always that simple. So for instance, in the case of clouds, First, we can only observe clouds globally in the satellite era, so for the last 40 years. And then it turns out that that era is actually pretty special. It turns out that um, in the period, say, between 1980 and 2005, and this actually sort of continues to now, um, the red indicates regions where um, this, the sea surface is warming, and the blue indicates where it's cooling. So it's warming almost everywhere over the globe, both over the ocean and over the land. But um, it turns out there's one exception uh, in the recent historical record, which is the East Pacific. Now, there's a lot of natural variability in the Pacific, which can um, be over decadal scales, something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So there's one school of thought that that might be natural variability. Another one is that our climate models have kind of got it wrong, and there is a real reason why it's not warming here, which has to do with climate change. We don't know. And it turns out that that affects um, the clouds, because it turns out if you warm the warm part of the oceans compared to the cold part of the oceans, the warm part of the oceans determine the temperature of the atmosphere over the entire tropics. And basically, they put a lid over the atmosphere here, where it's warmer above the surface, but at the surface, it's actually getting a bit cooler. That favors more clouds. And those more low-level clouds reflect more sunlight. And so with this particular pattern of sea surface temperature, you actually get clouds reflecting more sunlight to space than if you had uniform warming. And that complicates the interpretation of the historic record, because over the last 25 years, 
when the world has been warming the most, we've had this pattern that's distorted the cloud response. So now we don't know what the long-term cloud response is going to be from the observations. So that's an example of how observational uncertainty can actually also um, make this into a difficult problem. Okay, well, so now let's go to the future. You know, okay, we have climate models. Uh, we've had them for a long time. Um, what might we be able to do better? Well, one recent uh, idea um, that's being promoted is what we call the digital twin. So this is based on the idea that we actually do have the computational power now to simulate the Earth at a very fine grid resolution where a lot more of the processes that we currently have to represent by code in climate models would be actually simulated directly by the simulation. Um, so uh, the idea then is, well, maybe with a model like that, it'll be so much like the real Earth that all these uncertainties will go away. I guess I would say this is a vision, but um, maybe a dream. Uh, I think it's dangerous as a vision. But the other thing about a model like this is we wouldn't need to downscale it. It would give us information at kilometer scale already. Well, OK, well, what's the problem with this? Um, the problem with this is very computationally expensive. So there will always be limits to the extent to which we can do this. Um, when the first model that tried to approach this kind of grid resolution of a couple of kilometers um, was pioneered, that was in 2005 by uh, a Japanese group um, who were testing out their hot new supercomputer. And, uh, and they actually uh, were able to do simulations at global three kilometers for, I think, uh, a couple of days. Um, the current state of the art is that models of this scale can actually be integrated but for a couple of years, which is great. Uh, but it's still not enough for climate modeling, where we need to be able to run many instances of the model for 100 years to see what happens over a century. So these models are good. But they aren't, at this point, the answer to our wishes because they're too expensive. Um, and I should point out that we have a local hero in this. We have a model run at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab called XShield, three-kilometer version of our global uh, weather forecast model in the United States um, that, in fact, is right at the forefront of exploring what these models can do. OK, so let me just talk about that. So, um, so XShield, then, uh, is a three-kilometer global model. Um, this is an example of what the clouds oops, um, uh, forecast by uh, XShield look like a couple of days into a forecast. So this was a, started from the, well, our best guess at the real atmospheric state uh, at some time in the past, and then you can see it, the model spins up clouds, like, for instance, a, a, a tropical cyclone, a typhoon in the Pacific, all kinds of other clouds, frontal systems. And if I, you know, this, this looks pretty realistic. Passes the, what we call the eyeball norm. Uh, so, uh, so maybe it is the digital twin that we want. Um, well, you might want a little more proof that it's actually doing the right job. So one thing we can do is compare the rainfall produced by this model at various locations um, with our best observational guess. And so this shows you a picture of that. So red indicates places where the time mean rainfall over a period of a couple of months was more than the observation showed in blue is where it was less. And of course, the observations here aren't perfect either, but um, it's probably good enough for this comparison. And you can see there's some red and blues. The model is not perfect. It's pretty good, though. There's a lot of white here, too. Um, and if you compare it with the same, basically the same model, but run with a 200-kilometer grid, you can see the 200-kilometer grid only does about half as well in figuring out the rainfall. It, it makes by, uh, errors that are twice as big. So you know maybe this model isn't perfect, but it's a lot better than this one. Uh, so that, again, is the, is the um, promise of the digital twin. OK, well, here's another um, slide about that. Um, you know, GFDL isn't the only uh, climate modeling group that's been making models like this. Since uh, about 2015, there are a whole bunch of groups internationally that have been starting to try to do this. 
And there was a, what we call an intercomparison, where all of the models basically made a weather forecast starting on exactly the same day, ran it out 40 days, so long past when the weather forecast would be uh, you know, accurate, and then just looked at how well the models compared with each other. And so this shows uh, simulations with 10 models. And one of these is a satellite picture. And uh, you can try and figure out which one it is. Um, in any case, the fact that it's not so easy tells you that these models, again, are passing as a group this eyeball norm of somehow bracketing what the observations do, at least as far as clouds are concerned. Now, of course, this looks good, but we know that there are uncertainties in these models. Some of them actually produce more clouds. Like here, the model produces a fair amount of cloud. This neighboring one, this produces a lot less cloud. So they don't agree with each other, and there are physical uncertainties, which are the reasons for that. So the question is, okay, there are some uncertainties. So how could we use these models, though, for climate? And how could we further improve them is another question, but I'm not going to really address that question. So now I'm going to turn to, okay, well, these models are an interesting new tool. Maybe they're not the perfect thing, but they are better than the models we have. Uh, how can we use machine learning? And in particular, is there a way we can use machine learning to translate the improved simulations perhaps to uh, being able to do climate change prediction more reliably. Um, okay, so here the sort of promise of machine learning here, and this is sort of unique to this field. In fact, there's not a single thing here that mentions climate, uh, is that, uh, okay, well, what does machine learning buy for you? Well, if you're uncertain about how to represent something, but if you have some kind of a, oracle of, say, a fine grid model that you believe, you can try and use machine learning to learn that thing. And it will, hopefully, your way of representing it will then be free of human biases about the process. Um, in addition, uh, machine learning can run very uh, efficiently on certain kinds of computer architectures involving what are called graphical processing units. And so um, potentially, if you make a machine learning model, that you could use as a climate simulator, it could run a lot faster than current climate models and still be just as accurate. And that might make it more accessible to more people for more applications if it could run a thousand times as fast or on a much smaller computer. Uh, furthermore, we spend a lot of model time and effort um, developing uh, climate models that can run across a range of grid resolutions for a range of purpose. So it's, uh, you know, maybe this way we could invest all of our effort in making the fine grid model better and then get the rest of them for free. Um, so is it time to get hitched? I mean, are we, are we ready for this? Um, well, that was sort of what, what got my group uh, started. So basically, um, we started three years ago um, uh, at Vulcan Incorporated, which was... Um, uh, founded by Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft, uh, while he was still alive, uh, for all of the things he was interested in. And, uh, and then um, he was interested in climate modeling toward the end of his life, so he said, okay, we're going to do this. Hired some people, including me, to start a climate modeling project. Um, and uh, this is the group of people uh, who... Um, Yeah, there we go. Uh, who work with me? Uh, we have um, something like uh, seven scientists, uh, one of whom has now since been poached by NVIDIA. Um, but in any case, uh, what, our work is all philanthropically supported. It's all open source. And the goal, in the end, is to try and have the uncertainty of regional uh, precipitation prediction, whatever that means extremes, means, et cetera. Luckily, it's a nice nebulous goal that we will claim uh, success on no matter what we do. Um, so uh, actually, in addition to my part of this group, there's another part that's devoted to trying to make these very fine grid climate models run a lot faster on modern computers. And both sides of the group have partnered with uh, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab here at Princeton, NOAA Lab, uh, from the start. So, in fact, uh, one of our team members uh, here, Spencer Clark, is actually at GFDL. The rest of us are based in Seattle. 
OK, so what, what do we try and do in terms of machine learning? Well, the concept of our machine learning was uh, as follows. So you know, we know that coarse grid climate models aren't terrible. Um, it's actually still pretty good. So maybe what we can do is use machine learning to kind of correct a coarse grid climate model to basically exactly track the evolution of a fine grid climate model that we actually believe is more accurate or some other kinds of reference data set that we trust. Um, and so our machine learning was just designed to try to do that. And the way that, it's, the way that we ended up setting it up is uh, that we, we have a, a, a fine grid reference simulation that we believe is the truth. And then we take our coarse grid climate model and we step it forward. We make a forecast with it. But as we make that forecast, then we constantly nudge it. We kind of constantly push it back to the atmospheric state that this model is predicting. OK. What, and what we can learn then is, is how hard do we have to push to make the coarse resolution model behave like the reference model. So that so-called nudging tendency then tells us how far off is that coarse model in producing what we think is the right answer. And uh, if we know that, then we can try and machine learn that so-called nudging tendency uh, as a function of inputs, features, uh, that um, will then allow us to predict a correction to make to this model to make it look like the, the one over here. So it's a pretty simple idea. But there are a lot of complications. I mean, one thing is it turns out we're trying to learn something that sits inside of a climate model. So uh, that climate model then has other components. It has its, the fluid flow in the climate model. It has the other representations of the other physical processes. And it turns out as soon as you add this machine learning correction to it, it feeds back on those other things too. And so it means that what the machine learning does when you train it and what you do when you run it in this interactive mode, they're, they're two different things. And so as a result, it turns out you have a lot of steps to go from offline skill of your machine learning, what you can actually do with Python and all of the associated packages, to get stable climate simulations that make accurate weather forecasts, which have a relatively unbiased climate. That's challenging. So there are some specific challenges to our branch of machine learning. Uh, which are different than some other branches. OK, well, to cut a long story short, though, how, how well can we do? Well, so we can use this kind of corrective machine learning to try and learn from observations. So here we, we, we know the real state of the atmosphere, or we can estimate it on a grid um, through a process called reanalysis um, for basically the last 50 years. So we can use that to train our model. We can try and have it more accurately track reanalysis. And so um, if we add a machine learning correction to our original coarse grid climate model, we can ask, well, does it make a better weather forecast? Ideally, you know, you made the model better, you should make a better forecast. And so a way we can tell that is by looking at the error in the forecast versus time. And here the error is in one variable, the pressure, the surface pressure uh, that we're looking at. And here, the error versus time of the original model is in black, and in red is our machine learning corrected model. And you can see we have the same error at three and a half days that the original model had at two and a half days. So we basically added a day of forecast skill to the model. So that's great. We did something positive there. Um, so another thing we can do is if we look at our original forecast model uh, run at this resolution and we ask averaged over time, uh, you know, how biased is the, the rainfall distribution? And we just like average the rainfall over the entire globe, just over land, and just over ocean. You can see this model has a kind of painful bias, where globally it's getting the right amount of rainfall, but the original model has way too much of that rain over land and way too little over ocean. Well, our corrective machine learning, although it wasn't, it wasn't trained on climate at all, it was just trained to make the model stay close to the reference for a single time step, um, the machine learning basically almost completely removes those biases. We can use so-called random forests or neural nets to do the machine learning. Either approach gives almost no bias 
in uh, rainfall over the land and reduces the bias over the ocean too. So that's good too. So basically that shows we can, we can do something here. So where we really want to go with this though is climate modeling. So in order to do climate modeling, you have to have a model that will, uh, a machine learning correction in this case, that will work in all climates so that you can apply it with climate change. So now the question is, well, how do I even train this? And now the way that I train this is on simulations I trust in a small set of climates that span the whole range that I'm going to be interested in. So in this case, what we did was we did simulations with a climate that's four degrees colder, current climate, four degrees warmer, and eight degrees warmer in sea surface temperature. And we just basically artificially added a surface temperature perturbation to the ocean everywhere uh, of this amount. And then we trained a single machine learning correction uh, to match um, simulations where we nudge our model to each of those climates. So the same machine learning has to work across all four of those climates. And lo and behold, we are actually able to improve the results from the original model uh, in all climates. So for instance, again, looking at precipitation bias averaged over land, the original climate model in this case was actually bias negative over land. It was too dry. In all four climates, our, our machine learning corrected model almost removes that bias, going from a bias of minus 0.8 millimeters per day to zero per day. Uh, furthermore, the error, the patterns, the regional patterns of precipitation, which is what this is measuring, are also more accurately simulated with lower error, that's further down on the scale, with the machine learning correction in all four climates compared to in the original simulation. So again, machine learning has helped us achieve this goal of getting closer to a reference simulation. So that's nice, okay, but machine learning can be better than that, right? So with machine learning, we have high expectations and I'd like to have a model that could predict the weather more perfectly and has no climate bias at all relative to the reference. You know, I don't want just a 25% reduction in the bias, I want a 90% reduction in the bias. Um, okay, well, so what can we do uh, to achieve that? Well, it turns out you need better machine learning than we've been using so far. And uh, in the three years since we started this project, there's been an explosion of interest in use of machine learning to study, uh, to improve uh, weather prediction especially. In climate too, but that's got less far. I think our project is kind of the high watermark of climate. But in weather though, um, there have been some groups that have used something called full model emulation. So here in full model emulation, you don't let the original computer weather forecast model do any of the prediction. You replace the entire model at all global grid points uh, with a machine learning model that will basically emulate the original forecast model. Uh, or in this case, uh, can actually emulate a reanalysis. And so in this case, then this model is entirely based on emulating a reanalysis with a single machine learning model that covers the entire globe. And um, so just as an example that this can work, uh, this is a, a forecast of an atmospheric river. So you'll have to figure out what's going on here. This is longitude, this is latitude, and uh, the west coast of the United States is here. And what you're doing is looking at, at a, a tongue of moist air, that's the yellow and reds here, that's impinging at the time of, uh, of the uh, forecast initialization at um, in Vancouver Island. And then as time goes on, that tongue of moist air moves south and intensifies. And that's a stream of moist air that's coming, hitting the west coast, dumping a bunch of rain. And so here is the uh, reanalysis. So this is the truth. Uh, spatial pattern of, of water vapor uh, in the atmospheric column evolving with time. And this is the, um, the emulator. And you can see that, okay, the truth is on the bottom, excuse me. The emulator is on the top. And even after 72 hours, you'd be hard pressed to tell these apart. So um, basically, this emulator here is doing a darn good job of representing the truth. And in fact, it's almost as accurate as the world's best forecast model in making this prediction. But it only costs way less than a thousandth as much. 
Um, so um, if we could suitably generalize this to climate modeling, this might enable us to run our climate models a thousand times faster uh, with similar accuracy uh, to our highest resolution model. So that's kind of the dream. Okay, so that just gets me my last point here, which is, okay, well, what does it take for machine learning to get adopted in any physical science field, and in particular in climate modeling? Well, the first thing is you need spectacular results. People are not going to adopt new technology until it's so obviously better than what they're doing already that they are kind of forced to switch. Uh, and you can see ForecastNet, this, this emulator, is an example of a spectacular result. Uh, then you need to believe that this is reliable, that that, wasn't, that result wasn't just the one case they happened to show. Um, and so you need to show that this always works, that the model doesn't crash. You need to make sure that when you change your oracle, your model that you believe to be the truth, that it would be rapidly retrainable, that you wouldn't have to wait for years to get a new emulator. And lastly, the science community demands that, that okay, if you get results from this model, I should be able to pick it apart and figure, it out, figure out why it worked. And that's generally interpretability. And we should be able to figure out, okay, well, the machine learning had a whole bunch of inputs. Which of those inputs did it depend on the most? Did it care about most of the inputs? That's explainability. So you need to have all of these five ducks lined up in a row before the world is actually going to take your fabulous new method and actually use it. And that's actually a long process. The social process of doing that is probably a five to 10 year process after we actually have a mature enough technology to, to start doing this with. So, uh, okay, so that brings me to my conclusions. So, here we talked about different things. Uh, first, we talked about that current climate models are actually pretty good at a lot of things, uh, and certainly good enough for mitigation and policy work. But they aren't so good at some things, like regional precipitation, which are very important for uh, adaptation studies. A new generation of fine grid climate models promises some improvement. They can go down to the local scale. The grid is at the local scale. And maybe they're uh, a bunch more accurate at some of those um, things that give conventional climate models trouble. You can't run them for long, but potentially we can still use them for climate change research using machine learning emulators that can get the same accuracy at a thousandth of the cost. So thanks. Hey, my name is Gabe. Uh, thank you very much f for your talk. It was awesome. Uh, very, very cool to see. My question is, so my understanding is that what your model is doing is it's just nudging the course model in each time step, right? And so I'm mm -hmm. curious if you're doing something like that, and if you want to know about changes to extremes, right? Yeah, this is, is, very, yeah. <laughs> is that going to work? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so OK, yeah. So. The machine learning that we did was really aimed at one problem, which was sort of try to get the mean precipitation better. And it turns out for extremes, it does a lousy job because the nature of the correction is actually that it tends to be a fairly smooth correction so that in an individual grid column of a climate model where you might see an extreme event, uh, the correction won't be very much different than the correction in a neighboring box. And so, um, so it's not so good for correcting extremes. Uh, this emulator uh, approach actually has a lot of uh, more promise there, I would say, uh, overall. But even there, the problem is anytime you use a neural net, it, it is trying to make an average prediction across the data. And so it, it's nice then to introduce a technique which has some stochasticity, which adds some sort of random variability, so you might capture. Uh, extremes in some statistical sense, anyhow. And so, yeah, so one of the methods we're currently uh, looking at will actually help us with that, too. Uh, but that's totally TBD, whether it helps enough. A lot of the techniques uh, which we're currently using right now actually came from other machine learning fields. So, for instance, um, a lot of this came from looking at uh, computer vision and, uh, and image, basically, um, 
various kinds of image processing, machine learning. Um, because it turns out that maps and even three-dimensional volumes and how they change, well, that's a lot like image and video as far as machine learning is concerned. Thanks. So, uh, very encouraging results, actually, Chris. Thanks for the talk. Um, um, my question actually kind of touches on your last point. Uh, often the costly part of doing climate or weather simulations is, is the ensemble. So mm -hmm. is there a way of running one model at a fine resolution and then instead of rerunning it multiple times, uh, just getting the, uh, the machine uh, learning emulators to, to create the ensemble from the base? Yeah, so, so that's definitely the, the, sort of the, the lowest hanging fruit uh, from making the emulator is if, you now, if your model is now a thousand times as fast, it means you can generate an ensemble uh, very efficiently. And in fact, also, um, because you know, the emulator will typically be something that runs on a few GPUs, you know, if you're on the cloud, you have potentially thousands of GPUs. You now have a you know, perfectly parallelizable system, uh, you know, embarrassingly parallel, thousand, uh, say a thousand member ensemble. And so you can do ensembles very cheaply and, and, and very rapidly. And so that will be game changing for a lot of things, including potentially uh, data assimilation for, uh, for weather forecasting is one application there. I also had a clarification, the minus four zero plus four plus eight, I mean, those would be equivalent to multiple RCPs, which mm -hmm. basically implies that the same training will work regardless of the RCP. You don't have to retrain it for every RCP. Right? Uh, that's right, so the idea here is that, um, well, in this case now, again, w right now we are training an atmospheric model. The ocean is not interactive. We specify the sea surface temperature, but, um, but basically the idea is, yeah, you train it so that the extremes that your machine learning sees are outside the extremes you expect your simulation is, is going to produce. And so one thing we did just to check that that works is we actually did another simulation with our reference model where we gradually raised the sea surface temperature by one degree a year for four years. And we looked to see in the intervening years where now we're talking about something between uh, the climates that we actually trained on, do we still get a better simulation relative to our reference by adding the machine learning correction? And the answer is yes, we do. So it's able to interpolate between those different climates just fine. Thanks for the talk. So if instead of focusing on predictions, you were just focusing on improving your model, can you use the uh, improvements you made, the nudging pressure that you said to go back oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. and, and mm -hmm. redo the model with the, learn a lesson from there. Yeah, so I think, yeah, the nudging tendency fields give you enormous information about the errors of your model relative to the reference. And so, yeah, there's a lot of potential there. The difficulty is figuring out how to use it because right now the parameter, the process of developing parameterizations in models is a, it's a human process. Human has to look at those bias fields, go, okay, what parameterization might be causing these biases and do a bunch of twiddling with that. It would be better to have an automated process where you had a known set of uncertain parameters in your model that you then tuned sort of to optim or to minimize those nudging tendencies. But in fact, we have a project we're starting up with uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs using a DOE model that's exactly aimed at using those processes in tandem of, of use the nudging tendencies to learn the best um, adjustment of the parameters in the physical parameterization and then use the m machine learning correction for the residual.